For this segment, we will focus on the system of protection of freedom of expression in the Americas, South, Central and North America. We will review the circumstances of its establishment, the specificities of the protection system and the institution that are ensuring the implementation of the commitment to freedom of expression. We will see that the inter-American system has probably become the most effective system of protection for freedom of expression, both in theory and in practice. Let me begin, though, by highlighting the complexity of the system itself, which may have augured badly of the level of protection it was eventually able to contribute and to give to the people of Latin America and Central and North America. The political body responsible for overseeing the, the system is the Organization of American State, or OAS, set up at the end of the 19th century under a different name. In 1948, at the 9th International Conference of American State meeting held in Bogota, Com Colombia, the 21 participating states adopted the Charter of the Organization of American State and the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. With this declaration, the American continent was the first, in fact, to adopt an international convention on human rights, since the UDHR itself was adopted only eight months later. On the other hand, only 11 members of the OAS are currently officially subjected to the American Declaration. Further, its extensive elaboration on the duties of men is rarely, if ever, mentioned, probably seen as counterproductive and counterethical to the human rights vision. The declaration is certainly not as important and well known as a second regional human rights document adopted in 1969, the American Convention on Human Rights, which entered into force in 1978, more or less along the same time as the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Before presenting the normative protection of human rights, let me highlight a few more elements of the complex inter-American system. It has two central accountability bodies, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, established in 1959, uh, although its existence is actually linked to the 1948 OAS Charter and the Declaration of the Rights and Duty of Man. The role of the Inter-American Commission is to promote and protect human rights in the American hemisphere through the issuance of advisory opinion and by monitoring the human rights situation in member states. The second accountability body is the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, established with the other convention uh, on human rights, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, adopted in 1968. The complexity of the human rights protection regime of the American continent stems from the dual structures, although not quite parallel. 11 member states are subject to the law of the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man and to the advisory opinion issued by the Inter-American Commission, but not by the ruling of the Inter-American Court. And then you have 21 member states who are subject to the laws of the American Convention of Human Rights and to the advisory opinion of the Inter-American Commission and to the ruling of the Inter-American Court. The Inter-American Commission, at the link between the two structures, plays thus a central role in unifying the normative structures and the protection of human rights throughout the continent. In spite of the complexity, or maybe because of the complexity, the Inter-American system, particularly the Convention on Human Rights, the Inter-American Commission and the American Court, all together have played a central role to the protection of human rights on the continent and beyond. Let me uh, draw back a little bit here and, and describe the, the context behind the enactment of the Inter-American Co Convention on, on Human Rights. The 1970s in the Americas were years of great instability, 
There were violent regime changes resulting in the establishment of military government and large-scale human rights violation, disappearances, torture, execution. All of these in an international context of Cold War and economic crisis. Human rights were largely perceived as a tool of US foreign policy selectively and inconsistently applied. That kind of history augured badly of the importance of human rights protection in the Americas. The adoption of the American Convention with its strong commitment to civil and political rights, including freedom of expression, is thus particularly remarkable. And this is largely thanks to the drafter and members of the Inter-American Commission, people of great vision and commitment to human rights. Let's now turn to this convention and particularly to Article 13 related to freedom of expression. You can see Article 13 on your screen. Let me highlight why it has been described as the most advanced protection of free expression of any other international instrument. In one of its advisory opinion, the Inter-American Court clarified Article 13 as follow. It said, Article 13 may be violated under two different conditions, circumstances. The first one, it described as extreme or direct violation of the right to freedom of expression. And that is to be done through prior censorship, including the seizing of publication. Here, the violation is extreme, not only in that it violates the right of each individual to express himself, but also because it impairs the right of each person to be well informed and then affect one of the fundamental prerequisites of a democratic society. Article 13, as you can see, specifically prohibit prior censorship. That the first time that notion is being brought into an international convention. It's the only instrument that expressly includes the prohibition of prior censorship. What does prior censorship mean? Well, it goes without, uh, without saying that it is a form of censorship that happens prior to the time when people can actually read or access the information. So if a movie is being prohibited from being screened to the public, that's prior censorship. If a newspaper is being seized before it is reaching the, uh, the bookstore, that's prior censorship. The prohibition of prior censorship is neither the European Convention nor the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. None of those two documents contain similar provision. The fact that no other exception to this provision is provided is indicative of the importance that the author of the, the uh, Convention have attributed to it. And what they meant to do when they did that is to highlight the fact that freedom of expression is not only the right of the person to express himself or herself, but it is also the right of others to hear and receive that information in these ideas. The Inter-American Court was able to implement the prior censorship very quickly in a ruling that has become quite important. It was uh, Chile uh, versus The Last Temptation of Christ. That was a, a movie which the Catholic Church had deemed to be uh, reprehensible because of its, uh, the way it portrayed Christ and the Catholic Church. And the movie had basically been priorly censored. No one had access to it, no one could see it. The court went through um, the, the provision of the American Convention and it said, and I'm going to quote from them, Article 13 does not allow prior censorship, with one exception. In cases of the protection uh, of childhood and adolescence, However, the ban of that particular movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, applied to adults as well, not just to children and adolescents, and as such, it violated the Article 13 prohibition of prior censorship. So with this ruling, the American court really insisted that this is almost an unconditional um, prohibition. 
prior censorship is unconditionally prohibited. There is another aspect of the American Convention which is very important. It's a reference, again you can see that on your screen, to indirect violation. That's also the first time that such an expression found its way in a convention. The Inter-American Court has said that freedom of expression can also be affected without the direct intervention of the state, which will be conceived as constituting uh, a direct form of censorship. But indirect censorship can be done through media ownership, through the monopolies or oligopolies of media ownership. These are measures which have an adverse impact on the free circulation of ideas, the biased allocation of official publicity, the media concentration, but also poverty, all together are defined under the American system as amounting to an indirect violation of freedom of expression, as constituting an indirect form of censorship. That is a very radical and new ideals, including for the time. The court also elaborated on the scope of Article 13 and the legitimacy of the restrictions to freedom of expression. As I have already highlighted, prior censorship is a no-go. They are not allowed. But even uh, restrictions happening after publications have to be limited. And here the text draws heavily on the provision that you can find in the European Convention and in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It presents similar level of protection, including against illegitimate restrictions. Let me cite from the court here to, uh, to highlight how the American court has elaborated on the legitimacy of the restrictions. For a restrictions on freedom of expression to be legitimate, according to the American court, it must meet the following requirement. A, the existence of previously established ground for liability. This is a list of issues under which the um, restrictions can be done. We'll return to that. Two, the express and precise definition of these grounds by law. That's the principle of legality which I have mentioned in previous segment. Third, the legitimacy of the end sought to be achieved. That is very much in keeping with the principle of, of necessity and proportionality. A showing that these grounds of liability are necessary to ensure the, the ends of the restriction itself. So as you can see, the American court has very much defined the limitation to freedom of expression in very similar terms as the uh, European Convention and European Court, or as the ICCPR. I will finish this short overview of the American Convention and American system by highlighting some of its distinctive founding principles. The one that you may not find to the same extent either in the international system or in other regional system. We have already seen that both under the ICCPR and under the European system, democracy and democratic principles are seen as fundamental to the protection of freedom of expression, or rather that freedom of expression is um, essential to democracy and democratic principle. This is a principle that is also very present in the inter-American system. Let me give you an example which is uh, very revealing. In 1985, the government of Costa Rica submitted to the Inter-American Court a request for an advisory opinion regarding the interpretation of Article 13. In particular, Costa Rica was willing uh, to put in place a system that will uh, license the practice of journalism. Costa Rica had argued that the compulsory licensing of journalists could be justified uh, as a way to ensure public order under Article 13. And um, the court itself did not agree, actually, and it said the following. It made some important remark. First, 
freedom of expression constitute the primary and basic element of the public order of a democratic society, which is not conceivable without free debate and the possibility that dissenting voices be fully heard. Freedom of expression is a cornerstone upon which the very existence of a democratic society rests. It is indispensable for the formation of public opinion. It is also a condition sine qua non for the development of political parties, trade union, scientific and cultural societies, and in general those who wish to influence the public. It represents, in short, the means that enable the community, when exercising its opinion, to be sufficiently informed. Consequently, it can be said that a society that is not well informed is not a society that is truly free. So that's the American take on the principle of democracy and, and the centrality of freedom of expression to democracy. The court also developed a novel and distinctive conception of the importance of freedom of expression. I've already a little bit hinted to that in the context of our discussion on prior censorship that is a dual dimension of freedom of expression, meaning the individual and the social dimension of freedom of expression. And here again, I want to quote from the, um, the Inter-American Court. Those to whom the convention applies not only have the right and freedom to express their own thought, but also the right and freedom to seek receive and import, impart information and ideas of all kind. Hence, when an individual's freedom of expression is unlawfully restricted, it is not only the right of that individual that is being violated, but also the right of all others to receive information and ideas. The right protected by Article 13 consequently has a special scope and character which are evidenced by the dual aspect of freedom of expression. This, to me, is a remarkable uh, decision on the part of the court. It's a remarkable interpretation of freedom of expression and a unique one uh, in many ways. Uh, this is why for observers around the world, uh, for activists around the world, for experts as well, the inter-American system has possibly established the most progressive and radical reading of freedom of expression. One that moves beyond the individual, which as you may know is often one of the critiques addressed to freedom of expression, that it is solely about the individual. In fact, what the uh, American system and the American court has shown is that no, freedom of expression is not just about an individual, it's about the society, it's about the collectivity, it's about the community, and by so doing, it has very much breached the gap between individual and collective rights. Through freedom of expression, many other rights are exercised and the rights of a population are exercised, not just the right of one individual. This is what makes the inter-American system and the American court such important actors for the protection of human rights and freedom of expression in particular. In this segment, we have reviewed how protection of freedom of expression has been enshrined in the Americas, Latin, South and North. In the next segment, we will turn to another continent, Africa, where there too, freedom of expression has become protected through various regional instruments and conventions.